Hi everybody, Physics Ninja here. I recently had the opportunity to visit a local high school and talk to some really smart kids about waves. So I thought I'd put the lecture together and share it with the rest of my subscribers. So again, thanks for watching. If you have any questions at the end of this video, just leave them in the comments section. Remember, if you like the video, give it a thumbs up. If you don't like it, eh, just don't do anything. <laughs> and if you like my channel, consider subscribing. We do a lot of cool stuff here. All right, let's get started. All right, we're gonna do a mix of things today. We'll start with a brief introduction. We'll talk about different types of waves, and then we'll talk about what are the main characteristics of the waves and some of the language that's used to describe waves. I'll then spend a little bit of time focusing on sound waves specifically, and we'll do a small experiment to measure the speed of sound, uh, which you can also do at home if you have a couple buddies. Um, I'll then talk about electromagnetic waves that you may have heard of. Uh, Elon Musk recently saying he has a 70% chance he wants to go to Mars or he's going to go to Mars within his lifetime. So we're going to speed things up a little bit. I'm going to put him on Mars and we'll play around with electromagnetic waves. All right, waves come in various flavors. And this slide here just wanted to illustrate just a few of the more common ways we can encounter in everyday life. Uh, for example, if you grab the end of a string and you move your hand up and down as shown here in the figure, you can generate a wave that propagates down that string. Anytime you listen to music or you talk, or the fact that you can hear me speak in this video hopefully clearly is the fact that the speaker is moving in and out and creating a vibration in the air that is propagating as a wave. Uh, if you drop a stone in a pond, that will generate a ripple, which is a wave in water that will propagate outwards, such as this. And there's electromagnetic waves, which play such a critical role in our lives. They're used in radio broadcasting. We use them in microwave ovens and in cellular devices to make phone calls. Uh, clearly, the visible spectrum is also an example of electromagnetic waves, and they are used in medicine or x-rays. And you clearly have also heard of ultraviolet um, electromagnetic radiation. So there's many, many other types of waves. I think these are kind of some of the more common ones, and these are the ones I'm going to focus on today. All right, now the first kind of wave I want to talk about is a transverse wave. Um, what you can do, you can use a slinky like this to generate a transverse wave. I right, go to the dollar store, get a slinky. It's very, very easy. Just stretch it out a little bit and just keep one end fixed, and the other hand, uh, simply move it up and down. Okay, if you move your hand up and down, you're going to notice you're going to send a pulse or a ripple down that slinky. Eventually, it ends up kind of reflecting off the end, but you can see what a transverse wave is. And the word transverse basically means that I'm moving my hand up and down like this when I'm shaking that slinky, and the wave is propagating along the slinky, right? If you examine any little bit of this slinky, any little bit of this slinky does not move left or right. It only moves up and down, and yet the wave looks like it's propagating to the right. So that's the definition of a transverse wave. Um, with a short slinky, it's very hard to generate several kind of undulations like this uh, because the wave eventually reflects off my hand, but you get the picture. If I kind of stretched this out uh, along the floor, somebody held the other end, I could probably then generate several of these undulations and watch the wave propagate down the slinky. Okay, so that's a transverse wave. You move your hand up and down, but the wave moves <laughs> along the rope or along the slinky in this case. All right, what I wanna do now is look at the anatomy of a wave here. I've got a whole bunch of different pictures. Let me just kind of label them like this. And clearly time is going to move in this direction over here. I'm gonna originally start over here at rest, right? And what I'm going to initially do is move up. And I'm pinching a section of the rope and I'm pinching it quite hard, therefore that section of the rope is always going to move with my hand. So if I start over here, I'm gonna call this where the dashed line is, this is kind of where I started. So initially I move up and I move up a certain distance A, and then I come back down to the where I started, right, that dashed line, and then actually then I go back down and I go back down a certain distance A, and then I go back to where I started. So this brings my first definition over here, the first definition is this one over here. It's the amount of time that it takes to do one cycle, right? This is one complete cycle of moving my hand all the way up, back to where I started, all the way down, and back to where I started. Okay. So first definition is, so this time, the time uh, for one cycle, 
This is what we call the period of the wave. And we use the letter T, uppercase T, to describe that. And what we're going to do here is we're going to measure that in seconds. And it's really seconds per cycle, right? Seconds per one cycle. That is the period of the wave. Uh, something that is really closely related to that is something we call the frequency of the wave. Uh, frequency is measured in um, cycles per second. And we also use one cycle per second is actually what we call a hertz. Okay. So you'll hear that word a lot when you're talking about the frequency of a wave. You could say the frequency of a particular sound wave is 400 hertz. That means it's 400 cycles per second. Uh, for this, we typically use the letter lowercase f to describe the frequency. And there's a relationship now between period and frequency, which you should be able to see. But if you don't, here it is. It's that the period is equal to 1 divided by the frequency of the wave. Or you can write that the frequency is equal to 1 divided by the period. Right? Both of those expressions are the same. And you can see that the units are going to work out. All right. Another definition, well, I define this distance A, uh, it wasn't by accident, uh, this is what we call the amplitude of the wave, right? The amplitude of the wave is the maximum displacement. And it's basically simply the distance from the equilibrium, which is where the dash line was, all the way to the peak. Or I can also define it as the distance from the equilibrium, like in this case, all the way to the trough, right? The lowest point. So it's the maximum displacement. Now be a little bit careful. Um, it's not the distance from peak to peak. Some people define it that way. Just be clear that when you define it, we're really talking about the distance from zero to the peak or zero to the trough. All right, uh, amplitude, we're gonna measure that in meters. It's a distance. All right, great. Uh, the next thing we want to look at now is let's look at the generation of this, this wave here as a function of time. So again, I move my hand up and down, and if I first look at this first motion over here, well, I'm moving that blue dot upward. Well, that blue segment of rope over here, it's connected to the rope that's right next to it. So clearly that rope right next to it also has to move up. When my hand moves back down, well, eventually that section of rope is going to turn around and it's going to start moving back down, right? It just kind of lags a little bit, but it's going to end up doing exactly what the blue segment does. It just takes, there's just a slight delay for it. Now, that once this green, uh, this red section here moves up, well, it's moving upward. So it's going to be pulling on the next section of rope and that next section of rope is going to move up. Now this green segment's also connected to rope down here, which was initially at rest. But once the green moves up, guess what? It's going to pull up this orange section over here. And the orange section is connected to a piece that was originally at rest, a pink section, and that's going to move up like this, right? And you can keep playing this game and eventually you're gonna see that this edge, right? This edge, which was originally right here, um, is now kind of over here. And what we have here is we have a speed, we have this edge that's moving out at some speed V. Now actually, then when I keep moving my hand down, well, things are going to reverse, right? The blue pulls on the red, the red pulls on uh, the green, the green pulls on the orange and so forth. And you get the shape shown in figure three over here. And then I'm gonna move my hand back up. Well, back up, now again, the blue one moves up. Eventually the red's gonna turn around and the red's gonna end up kind of moving back up like this. And you're gonna get this picture down over here in figure four. And this is an important picture over here. And it brings another definition. Because I've done one complete cycle, right here, this distance here, this distance is a really important distance when we characterize a wave. All right, this has kind of a shape that might look familiar. If you've ever taken a trigonometry class, it looks like a full cycle, right? And it's something we call the wavelength. We usually use the Greek letter lambda to describe that distance. So let's go ahead over here and write it. So use the letter lambda, and that's what we call the wavelength of this wave. Now, what is the wavelength? Well, it really simply means it's the distance traveled by the wave 
um, in one period. That's the definition of the wavelength. All right, and the last section, or the last bit that's really important is the speed here. So if we think about our definition of a speed of something, uh, V is gonna be the speed. Again, that's going to be measured in meters per second. Um, it's basically the distance traveled by the wave. For example, in one period, I could look at any section of time, but let's look at how far the wave travels in one period. Uh, that distance traveled in one period is basically what I call the wavelength. So it's the wavelength divided by the period of the wave. Now, if you write this just slightly differently, just take out the one over T, and I do this on purpose over here, because the term in the bracket here, one divided by the period, is exactly the definition over here of the frequency of the wave. So at the end of the day, you can write that the speed, you can write that in terms of the wavelength, and the frequency of the wave. And this is a really important equation. All right, so those are the main components of a wave on a string. And a lot of these terms are actually, almost all the terms here are going to be used when describing other waves. For example, we're going to use speed, wavelength, amplitude, period, and frequency when we're talking about sine waves. We can also talk about these terms now when we're gonna talk about electromagnetic waves. Okay, it's the same kind of jargon, the same kind of language that's used. All right, another type of mechanical wave is something we call a longitudinal wave. And I can go back to my slinky and I can use a slinky to actually generate longitudinal waves. What I have to do in this specific case is instead of moving my hand up and down like in the transverse case, what I wanna do now is move my hand like this and basically produce compressions of the spring and then move my hand back. What's going to happen now is you're gonna get the wave that is going to propagate down the length of the slinky and if you examine any section of the slinky, each section of the slinky simply oscillates back and forth in the same direction as the propagation of the wave. That is what is called a longitudinal wave. All right, sound waves are an example of longitudinal waves. And the reason they are longitudinal is if you consider the above simulation over here, so this gray line simply represents, for example, the edge of a speaker, and that speaker simply oscillates back and forth. And what does it do to the air molecules that are really close to it? Those air molecules have to move with the speaker, right? So it produces these regions of compression, and then it moves away, and then it'll compress air again. And you can see these regions of compression, they basically propagate to the right. Right, you get these regions of high pressure where there's a large density of particles and those, again, will travel as a wave. Now, if you look at this uh, simulation, the red dots that you'll see in the simulation just highlight the motion of individual particles. And what you should notice is that those individual particles are simply oscillating back and forth. Right, they're oscillating back and forth, but you see the whole disturbance as a whole propagating down the pipe, in this specific case, to the right. Okay, but each individual particle is only oscillating back and forth. Now again, if I go back and I draw, for example, the pressure as a function of position, I would get this wave. <laughs> All right, here's the wave. Again, with that wave, I can define a wavelength, lambda. Now, in this case, the amplitude, it's not displacement. I could use displacement, right? I could use displacement of the particle to describe this amplitude. I could also use pressure. I could plot the pressure as a function of position, and this pressure here will propagate down and eventually reach my ear and sound beautiful if it's the kind of music I like. Okay, so sound waves are examples of longitudinal waves. Uh, hi everybody, so what I now want to do is I want to do a video experiment where we're going to try to measure the speed of sound. So I'm going to play a little clip for you. I want you to watch the clip and I want you to watch at the people clapping their hands. We've asked them to clap their hands uh, every time they're going to hear a sound uh, from a small speaker that's placed in the front. And have a look, do, why don't they clap their hands at the same time? Ask yourself that question when you're watching this video.
All right, what the video showed is that the sound takes a finite amount of time to travel a certain amount of distance, right? The speed of the sound is, is a finite number that we can actually measure. So that's gonna be the goal right now. I'm gonna to try to get an estimate of what the speed of sound is for this specific problem. All right, so let's have a look at what we have. So we have our sound wave generator right here, just the kind of a speaker. Basically, it generates a pulse or several kind of oscillations of pressure, compressions and rarefactions, and that travel along. And when each person hears that sound, they're going to clap their hands. So one thing I know just from uh, the video, we know that the distance between the first person and the last person, uh, that distance D is 80 meters. So let me write that down. If I'm looking to calculate the speed of something, think about our equation for the speed, the distance traveled, divided by how much time it takes to travel that particular distance, right? That's my definition of speed. So let me go ahead and write that down. So the speed of sound, just write it down as speed. It should be my distance D divided by the time, right? What is the time it takes for sound to travel along this 80 meter distance? So for that, we're not explicitly giving you the time. However, we should be able to calculate based on the information in the video. So number one, they do tell you that it takes 109 frames. Now remember, this is being recorded with a camera, which records a certain number of frames per second. So the rate at which we are recording frames is this guy right here. So we're recording at 480. Let me just write this down, frames per second. So actually, that means that each individual frame lasts a certain amount of time, right? Or there's a time spacing between each frame. And for that to calculate, you simply take the reciprocal of this number, and that's gonna give me something in seconds per frame, okay? So if I take one divided by 480, uh, what you should find is approximately, it's a little bit bigger, but we're just gonna write it down as two milliseconds. And I've done the conversion already. Okay, so now that we know that the distance or the time interval between successive frames is approximately two milliseconds, we should now be able to calculate what is the total time. Remember, the other important quantity is this one right here. It tells me that it takes 109 frames. So therefore, the total time for this specific case for the sound travel from zero all the way to 80 would be, well, it's 109 frames. Uh, multiplied by two milliseconds divided by frames. What you're gonna see here is that the frames will cancel out. Let's get rid of those. And the total time that I'm going to get is approximately 218. Again, that's milliseconds. All right, now we have everything we need to calculate the speed of sound. So let's go ahead and do that. So the speed is simply going to be equal to the 80 meters. And now I'll convert everything to seconds. And this is 218 multiplied by 10 to the negative three seconds. And that gives me a speed of sound. Put that in your calculator. Uh, let's go see what I got. Uh, I obtained a speed of approximately uh, 360 meters per second. And that's a pretty good estimate, okay, for what the speed of sound is traveling through air, just using this kind of simple technique. All right, so there's a finite speed at which the wave will travel. In this specific case, we got around 360 meters per second. Uh, if you look it up in textbooks, what you typically find is that the speed of sound, again, it depends on the temperature. However, the speed of sound, for example, at a temperature of uh, 20 degrees Celsius, uh, the speed of sound is approximately 340 uh, meters per second. All right, now I have a really important question for you to consider. Does the speed of sound, which is a longitudinal wave, does the speed of sound depend on the frequency of that wave? Think about it for a minute. And you can consider an example if you want, right? Imagine there's a sound being produced at a frequency F1, I don't know, let's just say 400 hertz, uh, versus another speaker which is right next to it, 
which is say generating a frequency which is twice that value. Let's imagine it's 800 Hertz. And the reason I ask you this question is because if you go back to my expression for the speed of sound, let me go ahead and write it over here. All right, we originally looked at uh, the speed and we said that it was equal to the wavelength, the distance traveled in one period, uh, multiplied by the frequency of that wave. Now, if you're only looking at this equation and not thinking about the underlying physics, you might say that, well, if I double the frequency, I might end up doubling the speed of that wave. Right? By moving that speaker in and out at twice the frequency, I might end up doubling the speed of that wave. However, you would be wrong. And here's just a very simple example to try to understand this uh, in everyday life. So here's my example. So does the speed of sound depend on the frequency? And the answer is no. Now imagine you spent a lot of money and you decided to go see an orchestra. So here you are. And you're sitting somewhere in the audience and you might be sitting closer to certain instruments than others, right? There's quite a lot of musicians here uh, playing in this orchestra. Now each one of them is playing a different instrument and over here on the right hand side, I have a chart of approximately the frequency range being played by some of those instruments. For example, the trumpet can play anywhere from 160 hertz, maybe to one kilohertz. Uh, some of the flutes can go a little bit higher, all the way to 2.5 kilohertz. Okay, so what it shows is that different instruments can play a variety of different ranges of frequencies. Right? If you just kind of look at all of this data over here, you can look at that for a little bit. But now you imagine you're over here, and the flute's playing down at one end. That's generating a sound wave that's traveling to your ear. And later on, these guys over here are playing a different instrument. And that may be also generating a sound wave that is going to travel to your ear. Now if you imagine what would happen if the sound over here was traveling at a certain speed, V1, and the sound being played over here was traveling at a different speed. It would be nearly impossible to enjoy the music being played by this orchestra. It wouldn't make any sense. Also, people sitting over here would probably hear a different concert than the one you're listening to over there. So clearly the speed of sound does not depend on the frequency. Okay, so now let's think about it. Now let's go to the next page and I'll describe what does the speed of sound depend on. And this is not only true for uh, sound waves or longitudinal waves like in the uh, slinky, but it's also going to be true for any type of wave like a transverse wave or any type of mechanical wave that we're going to look at. All right, I now want to discuss what does the speed of uh, waves depend on then? If it does not depend on the frequency, okay, so let's make sure we write that one down. Not on frequency. The source of the sound wave will determine the frequency. The shape of the instrument, the length, uh, the speaker I decide to play, that is going to determine the frequency. So the, the frequency really is dependent on the source. Uh, the speed, on the other hand, does depend on some things. Okay, it Depends really on two factors. What type of wave it is, so let's write this down. So transverse waves versus longitudinal waves versus maybe electromagnetic waves. So the type of wave that will play a factor in the speed of the wave. And number two, which is really, really important, it depends on the properties of the medium in which that wave is traveling in. So let me write that down. So properties of medium. Okay, so let's have a look. Uh, for example, properties of the medium could be how stretchy or how elastic it is. Okay, we call those restoring forces. So if I'm going to call the speed V, and again, I'm not going to write down an equation. I just want to get a feel of what, how the properties will impact the speed of waves. Okay, and for mechanical waves like waves traveling on a string um, or waves in a slinky, okay, the speed of sound waves, for example, uh, will depend on the restoring forces. So the larger the restoring forces, the larger the speed of sound, and it will depend inversely on the density of the material. Okay. Kind of like inertia, right? The inertial forces. The more inertia, 
the slower the speed of sound in that specific medium. So if you think about this expression for a little bit, maybe you can answer this question now. Would the speed of sound be larger in gases, in liquids, or in solids? If you think about this for a minute and just using the fact that the speed of sound gets bigger with larger restoring forces and it gets smaller with larger densities. Right. Uh, going from gases to liquids to solids, the dominant change there are the restoring forces. In solids, it's, it's very hard to compress or to stretch a solid, a metal bar, for example. So the speed of sound is going to tend to be very, very high. Versus in air or gases, you're looking at hundreds of meters per second. Versus in solids, it could be thousands of meters per second. Okay. Uh, if I go back to uh, my definition here, I said properties of medium. So the speed of sound in air, if I think about it in air alone, actually the speed of sound in air, if you look in most textbooks, you'll see that the speed of sound, and again, it depends on the properties of the air. So like the humidity, but also on the temperature. So if we consider dry air, for example, in dry air, the speed of sound looks like this, it's like 331 meters per second plus there's a correction factor that uh, gets applied with temperature. And this temperature here is in degrees Celsius. So if you put in 20 degrees Celsius over here, you're gonna add 12 to that number and I get approximately the 340 meters per second that I had previously. So the hotter it is, actually the speed of sound in that air is going to go faster, okay? Again, it depends on two things, properties of the medium and the type of wave that we're talking about, okay? Try to remember these two things. It does not depend on the frequency. All right, I now have another question for you, right? Which is often a misconception I hear from people who don't know a lot of physics. And the question is simple, can I hear anything in space? Now, clearly if I'm in my suit and there's a speaker there and I'm in a pressurized kind of container, uh, then absolutely I can hear something, right? Otherwise, <laughs> you would not be able to communicate with astronauts. But if somehow you weren't in your suit and that, that in, in it by itself is actually really dangerous to do, and I don't recommend doing that, but would you, are there sounds that travel in space? Think about it for a minute. Right. Uh, the answer should be no, there is no sound in space. And the reason there's no sound that can propagate through space is because there's nothing. There's just emptiness, right? This is empty. In order for to create a sound wave, I have to compress and decompress media, right? In air, that's possible, right? Because there's air molecules everywhere and those are, that's a compressible fluid. In space, on the other hand, I don't have any air. <laughs> Therefore, propagating sound waves is just cannot be done, okay? So if anybody says, can you hear anything in space? Um, and if you're not convinced by this kind of argument that I'm making over here, I want you to think about this next picture for a minute and think about how loud it would be. You imagine how sound would travel through space and our sun, which is this huge thermonuclear kind of explosion that's constantly kind of going, right? The equivalent of how many nuclear bombs, Right? It would be so loud on Earth if sound would propagate from the sun all the way to Earth. Right? It would be unbearable for humans if this was constantly going off. So thankfully, there is empty space and sound is not able to propagate an empty space. Another type of wave that we should be pretty familiar with are water waves. Right? Water waves, you can generate them simply by dropping a stone in a pond. And what you're going to find here is you're going to generate displacements of the water and those waves are going to travel outwards, radially outwards from wherever I drop the stone, right? These waves traveling at a certain speed. Actually, if you look at the motion now of individual particles of surface water waves, and here this simulation here uh, illustrates the motion of the particles, you'll notice that if you trace out the motion of individual particles for these surface waves, uh, what they look like are circles. Actually, the motion is not purely transverse nor longitudinal. They're kind of a mix of both, and they end up forming these circular paths. And as you go away from the surface and you go deeper underwater, clearly deeper underwater, uh, the circles get a little bit smaller. And if I'm really near the bottom, then there's no motion whatsoever. 
So these are much more complicated and rich waves, um, but they still have some of the same characteristics as regular simpler waves, such as a frequency, a period, a wavelength, and an amplitude. All right, the last type of wave I wanna talk about today are something called electromagnetic waves. And these waves here play a really critical role in almost every aspect of our lives. We may not even realize it. Uh, the wave is kind of depicted over here in the top left corner over here. Uh, first of all, you see kind of two envelopes, kind of two disturbances. Now let me just write disturbances, um, two disturbances in space. And in this case, the disturbances are actually electric fields and magnetic fields. Uh, even if you haven't really learned about those yet, um, just know that every wave is characterized by some kind of disturbance. In this case, it's electric field and a magnetic field. Uh, just as other waves that we discussed previously, the waves can be characterized by a wavelength. And the wavelength, again, is the distance from peak to peak. And you can either define it in terms of the electric field or in terms of the magnetic field, and you're going to get the same answer. So this is our wavelength over here. Uh, again, the wave is going to be characterized with a direction of propagation, which in this case over here is shown over here. This wave is propagating to the right. Okay, so that's also important. And it's propagating actually at a certain speed. And just like we saw for transverse waves and for longitudinal waves, our speed of the wave right here is given by the wavelength multiplied by the frequency. So this is the exact same expression we previously had. You notice here that I write the speed of the wave here using the letter C, and that's kind of a common thing that's done for electromagnetic waves. And the value of this value C, uh, at least, uh, through empty space or through air is a pretty good approximation. The speed of electromagnetic waves is this value over here, three times 10 to the eight meters per second, right? That's a really, really fast propagation that's happening. Uh, these waves are also kind of special because they don't require a medium to travel. For example, sound waves needed air or some kind of uh, medium, could be a solid, could be water, but something that kind of oscillates back and forth. Um, these electromagnetic waves, they actually don't require anything. These ones can travel actually in a vacuum, which is really what makes them special. All right, now there's a whole spectrum of electromagnetic waves, um, and you can characterize them again in terms of the wavelength and in terms of the frequency. Uh, the one thing that's common for all of these, again, is going to be the speed. The speed is 3 times 10 to the 8 if we're looking at these waves traveling in a vacuum. Uh, the short wavelength waves, call them over here at this end, and long wavelength is going to be over here. And again, since the speed of the wave is constant, that means that the frequency and the wavelength are basically the reciprocal of one another with this multiplicative constant called the speed of the wave. So short wavelengths can be really, really short. For example, x-rays are less than one nanometer in length. Uh, the visible spectrum, right, all the light that you see that your eye can detect actually falls within a quite a narrow range. Uh, the blue is approximately, again, approximately 400 nanometers, and red might be around 650 nanometers. So this entire range of the visible light is actually only a spectrum of approximately 250 nanometers in difference. Uh, as you get up into uh, longer wavelengths, for example, microwaves or radio waves, if you live in the city of Chicago and you listen to uh, 96.3 FM, uh, 96.3 is actually measured in megahertz. And if you evaluate what the wavelength is for this particular frequency of 96.3 megahertz, you should get a value of approximately 3 meters. So those are the wavelengths of radio waves. So you can see they actually span an entire really broad range of frequencies and wavelengths. All right, there was a recent article on the Washington Post uh, where there was an interview with Elon Musk, which is the founder, the CEO of SpaceX and Tesla and the Boring Company and all these other great things. Anyway, in that article, he discussed that and he mentioned that there was a 70% chance that in his lifetime, he would like to travel to the Martian planet and travel to Mars. So let's now have a look at Elon Musk. Let's put him on Mars. And the first thing you want to do when you get to Mars is you probably want to call home. 
So calling home will require you to have a special phone that has a powerful antenna and that's going to send a signal back to Earth. Let's try to calculate how long it would take for that signal to get from Mars all the way back to Earth. All right, so the question's pretty simple. How long would it take for the signal to go from, Earth, uh, from Mars all the way back to Earth? Now, I looked up a little bit of astronomical data over here, and this is, again, just approximate, just to get a rough idea. It clearly will depend on where you place Earth and Mars on their orbit, but we've taken this data here, and we're going to use this to calculate uh, the time it takes for the signal. Again, for this electromagnetic wave, I'll just call it EM, an electromagnetic wave to travel from Mars all the way to Earth. That's how long it's going to take for that signal to travel. Um, again, the speed is given by this. And really all you want to do now is the speed is going to be equal to the distance divided by the time. Uh, therefore, the expression for the time is simply going to be the distance uh, divided by the speed of this electromagnetic wave. So using uh, some of this data over here, I've given the distance from Earth to the Sun and also the distance from Sun to the, Mar uh, to the planet Mars. And again, this is when it's positioned in this particular position of their orbits. And now if I take the difference between both of those, I get a, an approximate distance of 78.3 million kilometers. Now keep in mind here, I'm working in kilometers and the speed is in meters per second. So we also want to do that conversion. All right, so what I want to do now is calculate the time. So using my expression over here, the distance will be 78.3. Uh, now million is 10 to the 6. And again, now it's kilometers, so it's really, um, let's go ahead and convert this, right? This is kilometers, and at the end I want to get meters. So I want to get rid of kilometers, and I want to get meters like this. And I know that in one kilometer there is 10 to the 3 meters. And if I do that, right, these kilometers are going to cancel out, and I'll be left with meters in the numerator. Okay, so now what I want to do now is I want to also now divide by the speed of light which is three times 10 to the eight. All right, you do a little bit of math here. Um, this'll give me 10 to the nine. Uh, this'll give me 10 to the eight. So I still have a 10 here at the top. So at the end, I'm left with roughly 783 divided by three. Um, put that in the calculator and I think you should get approximately 260 seconds. Um, that's a little over four minutes, right? over four minutes for that signal to travel, right? <laughs> All the way from here to there. Actually, it depends where it is on their orbits, like I mentioned. Um, actually, I looked this up just to see <laughs> what I would find on Google. And actually, the time is kind of anywhere from four minutes, and I think it can be as long as 21 minutes, depending on the distance between uh, Earth and the planet. So that's kind of interesting. All right, in this last section here, what I want to do is I just want to talk about the energy that's stored in these waves. First of all, in the string, uh, well, why is there energy stored in the string? When I have to create this disturbance, right, when I create this amplitude, for example, I actually have to stretch the string. So there is energy associated with, right, doing some work in order to stretch that a string and storing some elastic potential energy in the system. Uh, my disturbance in this case is actually A, which is my amplitude. Let's write that down. Okay, how about sound waves? Well, sound waves, again, there's energy stored in this wave because I have to compress air over and over and again. So this disturbance, I can either call it uh, pressure, right? I'm creating sections where there is excess pressure, um, or I can also write it also in terms of the amplitude of the displacement of the air molecules. I can choose either one as my metric for the disturbance over here. And the last one, while here I'm creating an electric field in space, uh, in order to create an electric field, or I can say I'm creating a magnetic field that oscillates back and forth. So the disturbance is really an electric field or magnetic field. Let's write that down. Electric field, I use the letter E, and magnetic field, you typically use the letter B for this. 
Now the question is, how much energy do you actually have? What's the total energy? And typically what we do is we talk about the either an energy density or how much energy you have per wavelength that you've created. Um, and what you're going to find actually in all of these different waves is that the energy, and I'm not going to go through and write the formula for each case. Uh, it could be a little bit complicated, but all of these are always going to be proportional to the disturbance squared. So what I'm going to find is that the energy per wavelength of transverse wave on a string is going to be proportional to the amplitude squared of that wave. So the bigger the amplitude, the bigger this kind of offset is here from the equilibrium, the more energy is stored in that wave. Again, for the pressure waves, I can either characterize it uh, in terms of pressure or amplitude. So the energy in a sound wave or the energy per unit wavelength, again, is going to be proportional to the disturbance. And in this case, the disturbance is the pressure squared. Okay, or you can also write it in terms of the displacement, the maximum displacement of these air molecules. It's actually the same. And the last one, now you got to be a little bit careful here because I'm using E for electric field and I'm also using E for energy. So be a little bit careful here. So actually I'm going to write this one out here. So just keep in mind, this is energy again, even if you're talking about energy per unit volume or energy, what you're always going to find is that the energy is proportional to the disturbance squared. And you can either write it as the electric field squared. Keep in mind here, let's make a little note. Uh, this is electric field. And again, it's the amplitude of the electric field, right? What's the maximum electric field here that I am producing? What's the magnitude of my disturbance? Uh, you can also write that energy is also proportional to magnetic field. Again, the amplitude of this disturbance would be given by B. So again, just remember that the energy stored in waves is always proportional to whatever the disturbance is in the system that's producing this wave. Uh, the energy is always proportional to that disturbance squared. All right, here are my six key takeaways for this uh, discussion that I had on waves. Um, the number one is really, really important, right? I may not have mentioned it throughout the, the entire video, but I hope you realize it when we were talking about the different types of waves. All of these waves transport energy, but they don't physically transport matter, right? It's always kind of systems that are oscillating back and forth, and the wave is moving through a medium. Uh, we specifically looked at the differences between transverse waves and longitudinal waves. Again, that had to do with the motion of the particles relative to the propagation direction of that wave. We've characterized the wave in terms of kind of common language. We introduced the term amplitude of a wave. We talked about the wavelength, the period and the frequency and how those two quantities were related to each other. And we also talked about the speed of the wave. Uh, this tiny little equation, V equals to the wavelength multiplied by the frequency, that's something you should always remember. Uh, one little caveat to that uh, equation was that the speed of the wave does not depend on the frequency of the wave. So keep that in mind. The speed of the wave is determined by two things. What type of wave are we talking about? A sound wave in air versus a electromagnetic wave traveling through space. Um, and it's also determined by the properties of the medium that it travels in. For example, if I want sound waves to travel faster, I could heat the air. That's changing the properties of a medium. Or I can go from a gas to a solid. That would be changing the properties of the medium. For a rope, if I want to increase the speed, what I could do is I can use either a thicker rope or a thinner rope. That would change the properties of the medium. Or I could increase the tension. Right? We talked about the restoring forces versus inertial forces. Those are the two terms that will kind of dictate what the speed of the wave is in a given medium. And the last thing we looked at was how much energy is there in this wave? What's the total energy of the wave? Um, again, if you can identify what the disturbance is that is propagating, look at the maximum value of that disturbance. The energy is always going to be proportional to the disturbance squared. Thank you for watching, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this talk. I hope you learned something about waves. And good luck with the rest of the semester.